Under the Pyramids by H.P. Lovecraft for Harry Houdini. 1. Mystery attracts mystery. Ever since the wide appearance of my name as a performer of unexplained feats, I have encountered strange narratives and events which my calling has led people to link with my interests and activities. Some of these have been trivial and irrelevant, some deeply dramatic and absorbing, some productive of weird and perilous experiences, and some involving me in extensive scientific and historical research. Many of these matters I have told and shall continue to tell freely, but there is one of which I speak with great reluctance, and which I am now relating only after a session of grilling persuasion from the publishers of this magazine, who had heard vague rumours of it from other members of my family. The hitherto guarded subject pertains to my non-professional visit to Egypt fourteen years ago, and has been avoided by me for several reasons. For one thing, I am averse to exploiting certain unmistakably actual facts and conditions obviously unknown to the myriad tourists who throng about the pyramids and apparently secreted with much diligence by the authorities at Cairo who cannot be wholly ignorant of them. For another thing, I dislike to recount an incident in which my own fantastic imagination must have played so great a part. What I saw, or thought I saw, certainly did not take place, but is rather to be viewed as a result of my then recent readings in Egyptology and of the speculations anent this theme which my environment naturally prompted. These imaginative stimuli, magnified by the excitement of an actual event terrible enough in itself, undoubtedly gave rise to the culminating horror of that grotesque night so long past. In January 1910, I had finished a professional engagement in England and signed a contract for a tour of Australian theatres. A liberal time being allowed for the trip, I determined to make the most of it in the sort of travel which chiefly interests me. So accompanied by my wife, I drifted pleasantly down the continent and embarked at Marseille on the P&O steamer Malwa, bound for Port Said. From that point, I proposed to visit the principal historical localities of Lower Egypt before leaving finally for Australia. The voyage was an agreeable one, and enlivened by many of the amusing incidents which befall a magical performer apart from his work. I had intended, for the sake of quiet travel, to keep my name a secret, but was goaded into betraying myself by a fellow magician whose anxiety to astound the passengers with ordinary tricks tempted me to duplicate and exceed his feats in a manner quite destructive of my incognito. I mention this because of its ultimate effect, an effect I should have foreseen before unmasking to a shipload of tourists about to scatter throughout the Nile Valley. What it did was to herald my identity wherever I subsequently went and deprive my wife and me of all the placid inconspicuousness we had sought. Travelling to seek curiosities, I was often forced to stand inspection as a sort of curiosity myself. We had come to Egypt in search of the picturesque and the mystically impressive, but found little enough when the ship edged up to Port Said and discharged its passengers in small boats. Low dunes of sand, bobbing buoys in shallow water, and a drearily European small town with nothing of interest save the great de Lesseps statue made us anxious to get on to something more worth our while. After some discussion, we decided to proceed at once to Cairo and the pyramids, later going to Alexandria for the Australian boat and for whatever Greco-Roman sites that ancient metropolis might present. The railway journey was tolerable enough and consumed only four hours and a half. We saw much of the Suez Canal, whose route we followed as far as Ismailia, and later had a taste of old Egypt in our glimpse of the restored freshwater canal of the Middle Empire. Then at last we saw Cairo glimmering through the growing dusk, a twinkling constellation which became a blaze as we halted at the great Gare Centrale. But once more disappointment awaited us, for all that we beheld was European save the costumes and the crowds. A prosaic subway led to a square teeming with carriages, taxicabs and trolley cars, and gorgeous with electric lights shining on tall buildings, whilst the very theatre where I was vainly requested to play, and which I later attended as a spectator, had recently been renamed the American Cosmograph. 
We stopped at Shepherd's Hotel, reached in a taxi that sped along broad, smartly built-up streets, and amidst the perfect service of its restaurant, elevators, and generally Anglo-American luxuries, the mysterious East, an immemorial past, seemed very far away. The next day, however, precipitated us delightfully into the heart of the Arabian Nights atmosphere, and in the winding ways and exotic skyline of Cairo, the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashid seemed to live again. Guided by our Baedeker, we had struck east past the Esbekiya Gardens along the Muski in quest of the native quarter, and were soon in the hands of a clamorous Cicerone who, notwithstanding later developments, was assuredly a master at his trade. Not until afterward did I see that I should have applied at the hotel for a licensed guide. This man, a shaven, peculiarly hollow-voiced, and relatively cleanly fellow who looked like a pharaoh and called himself Abdul Reis El Drogman, appeared to have much power over others of his kind, though subsequently the police professed not to know him and to suggest that Reis is merely a name for any person in authority, whilst Drogman is obviously no more than a clumsy modification of the word for a leader of tourist parties, Dragoman. Abdul led us among such wonders as we had before only read and dreamed of. Old Cairo is itself a storybook and a dream, labyrinths of narrow alleys redolent of aromatic secrets, arabesque balconies and aureoles nearly meeting above the cobbled streets, maelstroms of oriental traffic with strange cries, cracking whips, rattling carts, jingling money and braying donkeys, kaleidoscopes of polychrome robes, veils, turbans and tarbushes, water carriers and dervishes, dogs and cats, soothsayers and barbers, and over all the whining of blind beggars crouched in alcoves and the sonorous chanting of muezzins from minarets limbed delicately against a sky of deep, unchanging blue. The roofed, quieter bazaars were hardly less alluring, Spice, perfume, incense, beads, rugs, silks and brass. Old Mahmoud Suleiman squats cross-legged amidst his gummy bottles while chattering youths pulverize mustard in the hollowed-out capital of an ancient classic column, a Roman Corinthian, perhaps from neighboring Heliopolis, where Augustus stationed one of his three Egyptian legions. Antiquity begins to mingle with exoticism. And then the mosques and the museum, we saw them all, and tried not to let our Arabian revel succumb to the darker charm of pharaonic Egypt which the museum's priceless treasures offered. That was to be our climax, and for the present we concentrated on the medieval Saracenic glories of the caliphs, whose magnificent tomb mosques form a glittering fairy necropolis on the edge of the Arabian desert. At length, Abdul took us along the Sharia Muhammad Ali to the ancient mosque of Sultan Hassan and the tower-flanked Bab el Azab, beyond which climbs the steep-walled pass to the mighty citadel that Saladin himself built with the stones of forgotten pyramids. It was sunset when we scaled that cliff, circled the modern mosque of Muhammad Ali, and looked down from the dizzying parapet over mystic Cairo. Mystic Cairo, all golden with its carven domes, its ethereal minarets, and its flaming gardens. Far over the city towered the great Roman dome of the new museum, and beyond it, across the cryptic yellow Nile that is the mother of eons and dynasties, lurked the menacing sands of the Libyan desert, undulant and iridescent and evil with older arcana. The red sun sank low, bringing the relentless chill of Egyptian dusk, and as it stood poised on the world's rim like that ancient god of Heliopolis, Reharakte, the horizon sun, we saw silhouetted against its vermeil holocaust the black outlines of the pyramids of Gizeh, the Paleogean tombs there were hoary with a thousand years when Tutankhamen mounted his golden throne in distant Thebes. Then we knew that we were done with Saracen Cairo, and that we must taste the deeper mysteries of primal Egypt, the Black Chem of Re and Amen, Isis and Osiris. The next morning we visited the pyramids, riding out in a Victoria across the Great Nile Bridge with its bronze lions, the island of Gizere, with its massive lebak trees, and the smaller English bridge to the western shore. 
Down the shore road we drove, between great rows of lebaks and past the vast zoological gardens to the suburb of Giza, where a new bridge to Cairo proper has since been built. Then, turning inland along the Sharia El Haram, we crossed a region of glassy canals and shabby native villages till before us loomed the objects of our quest, cleaving the mists of dawn and forming inverted replicas in the roadside pools. Forty centuries, as Napoleon had told his campaigners there, indeed looked down upon us. The road now rose abruptly, till we finally reached our place of transfer between the trolley station and the Mina House Hotel. Abdul Reis, who capably purchased our pyramid tickets, seemed to have an understanding with the crowding, yelling and offensive Bedouins who inhabited a squalid mud village some distance away and pestiferously assailed every traveller for he kept them very decently at bay and secured an excellent pair of camels for us, himself mounting a donkey and assigning the leadership of our animals to a group of men and boys more expensive than useful. The area to be traversed was so small that camels were hardly needed, but we did not regret adding to our experience this troublesome form of desert navigation. The pyramids stand on a high rock plateau, this group forming next to the northernmost of the series of regal and aristocratic cemeteries built in the neighbourhood of the extinct capital Memphis, which lay on the same side of the Nile, somewhat south of Giza, and which flourished between 3400 and 2000 BC. The greatest pyramid, which lies nearest the modern road, was built by King Cheops or Khufu about 2800 BC, and stands more than 450 feet in perpendicular height. In a line southwest from this are successively the Second Pyramid, built a generation later by King Kephren, and though slightly smaller, looking even larger because set on higher ground, and the radically smaller Third Pyramid of King Mycerinus, built about 2700 BC, near the edge of the plateau and due east of the Second Pyramid, with a face probably altered to form a colossal portrait of Kephren, its royal restorer, stands the monstrous sphinx, mute, sardonic, and wise beyond mankind and memory. Minor pyramids and the traces of ruined minor pyramids are found in several places, and the whole plateau is pitted with the tombs of dignitaries of less than royal rank. These latter were originally marked by Mastabas, or stone, bench-like structures about the deep burial shafts, as found in other Memphian cemeteries, and exemplified by Perneb's tomb in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. At Geyser, however, all such visible things have been swept away by time and pillage, and only the rock-hewn shafts, either sand-filled or cleared out by archaeologists, remain to attest their former existence. Connected with each tomb was a chapel, in which priests and relatives offered food and prayer to the hovering K or vital principle of the deceased. The small tombs have their chapels contained in their stone mastabas or superstructures, but the mortuary chapels of the pyramids where regal pharaohs lay were separate temples, each to the east of its corresponding pyramid, and connected by a causeway to a massive gate chapel or propylon at the edge of the rock plateau. The gate chapel leading to the second pyramid, nearly buried in the drifting sands, yawns subterraneously southeast of the Sphinx. Persistent tradition dubs it the Temple of the Sphinx, and it may perhaps be rightly called such if the Sphinx indeed represents the second pyramid's builder, Kephren. There are unpleasant tales of the Sphinx before Kephren, but whatever its elder features were, the monarch replaced them with his own that men might look at the Colossus without fear. It was in the great gateway temple that the life-size diorite statue of Kephren, now in the Cairo Museum, was found, a statue before which I stood in awe when I beheld it. Whether the whole edifice is now excavated, I am not certain, but in 1910 most of it was below ground, with the entrance heavily barred at night. Germans were in charge of the work, and the war or other things may have stopped them. I would give much in view of my experience and of certain Bedouin whisperings discredited or unknown in Cairo to know what has developed in connection with a certain well in a transverse gallery where statues of the pharaoh were found in curious juxtaposition to the statues of baboons.
The road, as we traversed it on our camels that morning, curved sharply past the wooden police quarters, post office, drugstore and shops on the left, and plunged south and east in a complete bend that scaled the rock plateau and brought us face to face with the desert under the lee of the Great Pyramid. Past Cyclopean masonry we rode, rounding the eastern face and looking down ahead into a valley of minor pyramids beyond which the eternal Nile glistened to the east and the eternal desert shimmered to the west. Very close loomed the three major pyramids, the greatest devoid of outer casing and shewing its bulk of great stones, but the others retaining here and there the neatly fitted covering which had made them smooth and finished in their day. Presently we descended toward the Sphinx and sat silent beneath the spell of those terrible unseeing eyes. On the vast stone breast we faintly discerned the emblem of Re Haracte, for whose image the Sphinx was mistaken in a late dynasty. And though sand covered the tablet between the great paws, we recalled what Thutmosis IV inscribed thereon, and the dream he had when a prince. It was then that the smile of the Sphinx vaguely displeased us, and made us wonder about the legends of subterranean passages beneath the monstrous creature leading down, down to depths none might dare hint at, depths connected with mysteries older than the dynastic Egypt we excavate and having a sinister relation to the persistence of abnormal, animal-headed gods in the ancient Nilotic pantheon. Then, too, it was I asked myself an idle question whose hideous significance was not to appear for many an hour. Other tourists now began to overtake us, and we moved on to the sand-choked temple of the Sphinx, fifty yards to the southeast, which I have previously mentioned as the great gate of the causeway to the Second Pyramid's mortuary chapel on the plateau. Most of it was still underground, and although we dismounted and descended through a modern passageway to its alabaster corridor and pillared hall, I felt that Abdul and the local German attendant had not shown us all there was to see. After this, we made the conventional circuit of the Pyramid Plateau, examining the Second Pyramid, and the peculiar ruins of its mortuary chapel to the east, the third pyramid and its miniature southern satellites and ruined eastern chapel, the rock tombs and the honeycombings of the fourth and fifth dynasties, and the famous Campbell's tomb whose shadowy shaft sinks precipitously for fifty-three feet to a sinister sarcophagus, which one of our camel drivers divested of the cumbering sand after a vertiginous descent by rope. Cries now assailed us from the Great Pyramid, where Bedouins were besieging a party of tourists with offers of guidance to the top, or of displays of speed in the performance of solitary trips up and down. Seven minutes is said to be the record for such an ascent and descent, but many lusty sheiks and sons of sheikhs assured us they could cut it to five if given the requisite impetus of liberal bakshish. They did not get this impetus, though we did let Abdul take us up, thus obtaining a view of unprecedented magnificence which included not only remote and glittering Cairo with its crowned citadel and background of gold-violet hills, but all the pyramids of the Memphian district as well, from Abu Roche on the north to the Dasher on the south. The Saqqara Step Pyramid, which marks the evolution of the low Mastaba into the true pyramid, shewed clearly and alluringly in the sandy distance. It is close to this transition monument that the famed tomb of Perneb was found, more than 400 miles north of the Theban rock valley where Tut Ankh Amen sleeps. Again, I was forced to silence through sheer awe. The prospect of such antiquity and the secrets each hoary monument seemed to hold and brood over filled me with a reverence and sense of immensity nothing else ever gave me. Fatigued by our climb, and disgusted with the importunate Bedouins whose actions seemed to defy every rule of taste, we omitted the arduous detail of entering the cramped interior passages of any of the pyramids, though we saw several of the hardiest tourists preparing for the suffocating crawl through Cheops' mightiest memorial. As we dismissed and overpaid our local bodyguard and drove back to Cairo with Abdul Race under the afternoon sun, we half regretted the omission we had made. Such fascinating things were whispered about lower pyramid passages not in the guidebooks, 
passages whose entrances had been hastily blocked up and concealed by certain uncommunicative archaeologists who had found and begun to explore them. Of course, this whispering was largely baseless on the face of it, but it was curious to reflect how persistently visitors were forbidden to enter the pyramids at night or to visit the lowest burrows and crypt of the Great Pyramid. Perhaps in the latter case, it was the psychological effect which was feared, the effect on the visitor of feeling himself huddled down beneath a gigantic world of solid masonry, joined to the life he has known by the merest tube in which he may only crawl and which any accident or evil design might block. The whole subject seemed so weird and alluring that we resolved to pay the Pyramid Plateau another visit at the earliest possible opportunity. For me, this opportunity came much earlier than I expected. That evening, the members of our party feeling somewhat tired after the strenuous programme of the day, I went alone with Abdul Rais for a walk through the picturesque Arab quarter. Though I had seen it by day, I wished to study the alleys and bazaars in the dusk when rich shadows and mellow gleams of light would add to their glamour and fantastic illusion. The native crowds were thinning, but were still very noisy and numerous when we came upon a knot of revelling Bedouins in the Sukhan Nahasin, or Bazaar of the Coppersmiths. Their apparent leader, an insolent youth with heavy features and saucily cocked tarbush, took some notice of us, and evidently recognised with no great friendliness my competent but admittedly supercilious and sneeringly disposed guide. Perhaps, I thought, he resented that odd reproduction of the Sphinx's half-smile, which I had often remarked with amused irritation. Or perhaps he did not like the hollow and sepulchral resonance of Abdul's voice. At any rate, the exchange of ancestrally opprobrious language became very brisk, and before long Ali Ziz, as I heard the stranger called when called by no worse name, began to pull violently at Abdul's robe, an action quickly reciprocated and leading to a spirited scuffle in which both combatants lost their sacredly cherished headgear and would have reached an even direr condition had I not intervened and separated them by main force. My interference, at first seemingly unwelcome on both sides, succeeded at last in effecting a truce. Sullenly each belligerent composed his wrath and his attire, and with an assumption of dignity as profound as it was sudden, the two formed a curious pact of honour which I soon learned is a custom of great antiquity in Cairo, a pact for the settlement of their difference by means of a nocturnal fistfight atop the Great Pyramid, long after the departure of the last moonlight sightseer. Each duelist was to assemble a party of seconds, and the affair was to begin at midnight, proceeding by rounds in the most civilised possible fashion. In all this planning there was much which excited my interest. The fight itself promised to be unique and spectacular, while the thought of the scene on that hoary pile overlooking the antediluvian plateau of Gizeh under the wan moon of the pallid small hours appealed to every fibre of imagination in me. A request found Abdul exceedingly willing to admit me to his party of seconds, so that all the rest of the early evening I accompanied him to various dens in the most lawless regions of the town mostly northeast of the Esbekiyeh, where he gathered one by one a select and formidable band of congenial cutthroats as his pugilistic background. Shortly after nine, our party, mounted on donkeys bearing such royal or tourist reminiscent names as Ramesses, Mark Twain, J.P. Morgan and Minahaha, edged through street labyrinths both oriental and occidental, crossed the muddy and mast-forested Nile by the bridge of the bronze lions and cantered philosophically between the lebaks on the road to Giza. Slightly over two hours were consumed by the trip, toward the end of which we passed the last of the returning tourists, saluted the last inbound trolley car, and were alone with the night and the past and the spectral moon. Then we saw the vast pyramids at the end of the avenue, ghoulish with a dim, atavistical menace which I had not seemed to notice in the daytime. Even the smallest of them held a hint of the ghastly, for was it not in this that they had buried Queen Nitocris alive in the Sixth Dynasty? Subtle Queen Nitocris, who once invited all her enemies to a feast in a temple below the Nile and drowned them by opening the water gates. 
I recalled that the Arabs whisper things about Nitocris and shun the third pyramid at certain phases of the moon. It must have been over her that Thomas More was brooding when he wrote a thing muttered about by Memphian boatmen. The subterranean nymph that dwells, mid sunless gems and glories hid, the lady of the pyramid. Early as we were, Ali Ziz and his party were ahead of us, for we saw their donkeys outlined against the desert plateau at Kafr el Haram, toward which squalid Arab settlement close to the Sphinx, we had diverged instead of following the regular road to the Mena house, where some of the sleepy, inefficient police might have observed and halted us. Here, where filthy Bedouins stabled camels and donkeys in the rock tombs of Kefren's courtiers, we were led up the rocks and over the sand to the Great Pyramid, up whose time-worn sides the Arabs swarmed eagerly, Abdul Reis offering me the assistance I did not need. As most travellers know, the actual apex of this structure has long been worn away, leaving a reasonably flat platform twelve yards square. On this eerie pinnacle, a squared circle was formed, and in a few moments the sardonic desert moon leered down upon a battle which, but for the quality of the ringside cries, might well have occurred at some minor athletic club in America. As I watched it, I felt that some of our less desirable institutions were not lacking, for every blow, feint, and defence bespoke stalling to my not inexperienced eye. It was quickly over, and despite my misgivings as to methods, I felt a sort of proprietary pride when Abdul Race was adjudged the winner. Reconciliation was phenomenally rapid, and amidst the singing, fraternising, and drinking which followed, I found it difficult to realise that a quarrel had ever occurred. Oddly enough, I myself seemed to be more of a centre of notice than the antagonists, and from my smattering of Arabic I judged that they were discussing my professional performances and escapes from every sort of manacle and confinement, in a manner which indicated not only a surprising knowledge of me, but a distinct hostility and scepticism concerning my feats of escape. It gradually dawned on me that the elder magic of Egypt did not depart without leaving traces, and that fragments of a strange secret law and priestly cult practices have survived surreptitiously amongst the fellaheen to such an extent that the prowess of a strange hawi or magician is resented and disputed. I thought of how much my hollow-voiced guide Abdul Race looked like an old Egyptian priest or pharaoh or smiling sphinx, and wondered. Suddenly something happened which in a flash proved the correctness of my reflections and made me curse the denseness whereby I had accepted this night's events as other than the empty and malicious frame-up they now shewed themselves to be. Without warning, and doubtless in answer to some subtle sign from Abdul, the entire band of Bedouins precipitated itself upon me, and having produced heavy ropes, soon had me bound as securely as I was ever bound in the course of my life, either on the stage or off. I struggled at first, but soon saw that one man could make no headway against a band of over twenty sinewy barbarians. My hands were tied behind my back, my knees bent to their fullest extent, and my wrists and ankles stoutly linked together with unyielding cords. A stifling gag was forced into my mouth, and a blindfold fastened tightly over my eyes. Then, as the Arabs bore me aloft on their shoulders and began a jouncing descent of the pyramid, I heard the taunts of my late guide, Abdul, who mocked and jeered delightedly in his hollow voice, and assured me that I was soon to have my magic powers put to a supreme test, which would quickly remove any egotism I might have gained through triumphing over all the tests offered by America and Europe. Egypt, he reminded me, is very old, and full of inner mysteries and antique powers not even conceivable to the experts of today, whose devices had so uniformly failed to entrap me. How far, or in what direction I was carried, I cannot tell, for the circumstances were all against the formation of any accurate judgment. I know, however, that it could not have been a great distance, since my bearers at no point hastened beyond a walk, yet kept me aloft a surprisingly short time. It is this perplexing brevity which makes me feel almost like shuddering whenever I think of Giza and its plateau, 
for one is oppressed by hints of the closeness to everyday tourist routes of what existed then and must exist still. The evil abnormality I speak of did not become manifest at first, setting me down on a surface which I recognised as sand rather than rock, my captors passed a rope around my chest and dragged me a few feet to a ragged opening in the ground, into which they presently lowered me with much rough handling. For apparent eons, I bumped against the stony, irregular sides of a narrow, hewn well, which I took to be one of the numerous burial shafts of the plateau, until the prodigious, almost incredible depth of it robbed me of all bases of conjecture. The horror of the experience deepened with every dragging second. That any descent through the sheer solid rock could be so vast without reaching the core of the planet itself, or that any rope made by man could be so long as to dangle me in these unholy and seemingly fathomless profundities of nether earth, were beliefs of such grotesqueness that it was easier to doubt my agitated senses than to accept them. Even now I am uncertain, for I know how deceitful the sense of time becomes when one or more of the usual perceptions or conditions of life is removed or distorted. But I am quite sure that I preserved a logical consciousness that far, that at least I did not add any full-grown phantoms of imagination to a picture hideous enough in its reality and explicable by a type of cerebral illusion vastly short of actual hallucination. All this was not the cause of my first bit of fainting. The shocking ordeal was cumulative, and the beginning of the later terrors was a very perceptible increase in my rate of descent. They were paying out that infinitely long rope very swiftly now, and I scraped cruelly against the rough and constricted sides of the shaft as I shot madly downward. My clothing was in tatters, and I felt the trickle of blood all over, even above the mounting and excruciating pain. My nostrils, too, were assailed by a scarcely definable menace, a creeping odour of damp and staleness curiously unlike anything I had ever smelt before, and having faint overtones of spice and incense that lent an element of mockery. Then the mental cataclysm came. It was horrible, hideous beyond all articulate description, because it was all of the soul, with nothing of detail to describe. It was the ecstasy of nightmare and the summation of the fiendish. The suddenness of it was apocalyptic and demoniac. One moment I was plunging agonizingly down that narrow well of million-tooth torture, yet the next moment I was soaring on bat wings in the gulfs of hell, swinging free and swoopingly through illimitable miles of boundless musty space, rising dizzily to measureless pinnacles of chilling ether, then diving gaspingly to sucking nadirs of ravenous, nauseous lower vacua. Thank God for the mercy that shut out in oblivion those clawing furies of consciousness which half unhinged my faculties and tore harpy-like at my spirit. That one respite, short as it was, gave me the strength and sanity to endure those still greater sublimations of cosmic panic that lurked and gibbered on the road ahead. 2. It was very gradually that I regained my senses after that eldritch flight through Stygian space. The process was infinitely painful and coloured by fantastic dreams in which my bound and gagged condition found singular embodiment. The precise nature of these dreams was very clear while I was experiencing them, but became blurred in my recollection almost immediately afterward, and was soon reduced to the merest outline by the terrible events, real or imaginary, which followed. I dreamed that I was in the grasp of a great and horrible paw, a yellow, hairy, five-clawed paw which had reached out of the earth to crush and engulf me. And when I stopped to reflect what the paw was, it seemed to me that it was Egypt. In the dream I looked back at the events of the preceding weeks, and saw myself lured and enmeshed little by little, subtly and insidiously, by some hellish ghoul spirit of the Elder Nile sorcery, some spirit that was in Egypt before ever man was, and that will be when man is no more. I saw the horror and unwholesome antiquity of Egypt, and the grisly alliance it has always had with the tombs and temples of the dead. I saw phantom processions of priests with the heads of bulls, falcons, cats, and ibises, 
phantom processions marching interminably through subterraneous labyrinths and avenues of titanic propylia, beside which a man is as a fly and offering unnameable sacrifices to indescribable gods. Stone Colossi marched in endless night and drove herds of grinning androsphinxes down to the shores of illimitable stagnant rivers of pitch. And behind it all, I saw the ineffable malignity of primordial necromancy, black and amorphous, and fumbling greedily after me in the darkness to choke out the spirit that had dared to mock it by emulation. In my sleeping brain there took shape a melodrama of sinister hatred and pursuit, and I saw the black soul of Egypt singling me out and calling me in inaudible whispers, calling and luring me, leading me on with the glitter and glamour of a Saracenic surface, but ever pulling me down to the age-mad catacombs and horrors of its dead and abysmal pharaonic heart. Then the dream faces took on human resemblances, and I saw my guide Abdul Rais in the robes of a king with the sneer of the sphinx on his features. And I knew that those features were the features of Kefren the Great, who raised the second pyramid, carved over the sphinx's face in the likeness of his own, and built that titanic gateway temple whose myriad corridors the archaeologists think they have dug out of the cryptical sand and the uninformative rock. And I looked at the long, lean, rigid hand of Kefren, the long, lean, rigid hand as I had seen it on the diorite statue in the Cairo Museum, the statue they had found in the terrible gateway temple, and wondered that I had not shrieked when I saw it on Abdul Rais. That hand! It was hideously cold, and it was crushing me. It was the cold and cramping of the sarcophagus, the chill and constriction of unrememberable Egypt. It was knighted, necropolitan Egypt itself, that yellow paw, and they whisper such things of Kefren. But at this juncture I began to awake, or at least to assume a condition less completely that of sleep than the one just preceding. I recalled the fight atop the pyramid, the treacherous Bedouins and their attack, my frightful descent by rope through endless rock depths, and my mad swinging and plunging in a chill void redolent of aromatic putrescence. I perceived that I now lay on a damp rock floor, and that my bonds were still biting into me with unloosened force. It was very cold, and I seemed to detect a faint current of noisome air sweeping across me. The cuts and bruises I had received from the jagged sides of the rock shaft were paining me woefully, their soreness enhanced to a stinging or burning acuteness by some pungent quality in the faint draught, and the mere act of rolling over was enough to set my whole frame throbbing with untold agony. As I turned, I felt a tug from above, and concluded that the rope whereby I was lowered still reached to the surface. Whether or not the Arabs still held it, I had no idea, nor had I any idea how far within the earth I was. I knew that the darkness around me was wholly or nearly total, since no ray of moonlight penetrated my blindfold but I did not trust my senses enough to accept as evidence of extreme depth the sensation of vast duration which had characterized my descent. Knowing at least that I was in a space of considerable extent, reached from the surface directly above by an opening in the rock, I doubtfully conjectured that my prison was perhaps the buried gateway chapel of old Kefren, the Temple of the Sphinx, perhaps some inner corridor which the guides had not shown me during my morning visit, and from which I might easily escape if I could find my way to the barred entrance. It would be a labyrinthine wandering, but no worse than others out of which I had in the past found my way. The first step was to get free of my bonds, gag and blindfold, and this I knew would be no great task, since subtler experts than these, Arabs had tried every known species of fetter upon me during my long and varied career as an exponent of escape, yet had never succeeded in defeating my methods. Then it occurred to me that the Arabs might be ready to meet and attack me at the entrance upon any evidence of my probable escape from the binding cords, as would be furnished by any decided agitation of the rope which they probably held. This, of course, was taking for granted that my place of confinement was indeed Kefren's Temple of the Sphinx. The direct opening in the roof, wherever it might lurk, 
could not be beyond easy reach of the ordinary modern entrance near the Sphinx, if in truth it were any great distance at all on the surface, since the total area known to visitors is not at all enormous. I had not noticed any such opening during my daytime pilgrimage, but knew that these things are easily overlooked amidst the drifting sands. Thinking these matters over as I lay bent and bound on the rock floor, I nearly forgot the horrors of the abysmal descent and cavernous swinging which had so lately reduced me to a coma. My present thought was only to outwit the Arabs, and I accordingly determined to work myself free as quickly as possible, avoiding any tug on the descending line which might betray an effective or even problematical attempt at freedom. This, however, was more easily determined than effected. A few preliminary trials made it clear that little could be accomplished without considerable motion, and it did not surprise me when, after one especially energetic struggle, I began to feel the coils of falling rope as they piled up about me and upon me. Obviously, I thought, the Bedouins had felt my movements and released their end of the rope, hastening no doubt to the temple's true entrance to lie murderously in wait for me. The prospect was not pleasing, but I had faced worse in my time without flinching, and would not flinch now. At present, I must first of all free myself of bonds, then trust to ingenuity to escape from the temple unharmed. It is curious how implicitly I had come to believe myself in the old temple of Kefren beside the Sphinx, only a short distance below the ground. That belief was shattered, and every pristine apprehension of preternatural depth and demoniac mystery revived by a circumstance which grew in horror and significance even as I formulated my philosophical plan. I have said that the falling rope was piling up about and upon me. Now I saw that it was continuing to pile, as no rope of normal length could possibly do. It gained in momentum and became an avalanche of hemp, accumulating mountainously on the floor and half burying me beneath its swiftly multiplying coils. Soon I was completely engulfed and gasping for breath as the increasing convolutions submerged and stifled me. My senses tottered again and I vainly tried to fight off a menace desperate and ineluctable. It was not merely that I was tortured beyond human endurance, not merely that life and breath seemed to be crushed slowly out of me, it was the knowledge of what those unnatural lengths of rope implied, and the consciousness of what unknown and incalculable gulfs of inner earth must at this moment be surrounding me. My endless descent and swinging flight through goblin space then must have been real and even now I must be lying helpless in some nameless cavern world toward the core of the planet. Such a sudden confirmation of ultimate horror was insupportable, and a second time I lapsed into merciful oblivion. When I say oblivion, I do not imply that I was free from dreams. On the contrary, my absence from the conscious world was marked by visions of the most unutterable hideousness. God! If only I had not read so much Egyptology before coming to this land, which is the fountain of all darkness and terror. This second spell of fainting filled my sleeping mind anew with shivering realization of the country and its archaic secrets, and through some damnable chance my dreams turned to the ancient notions of the dead and their sojournings in soul and body beyond those mysterious tombs which were more houses than graves. I recalled, in dream shapes, which it is well that I do not remember, the peculiar and elaborate construction of Egyptian sepulchres, and the exceedingly singular and terrific doctrines which determine this construction. All these people thought of was death and the dead. They conceived of a literal resurrection of the body, which made them mummify it with desperate care, and preserve all the vital organs in canopic jars near the corpse whilst besides the body they believed in two other elements, the soul, which after its weighing and approval by Osiris dwelt in the land of the blessed, and the obscure and portentous Kaye, or life principle, which wandered about the upper and lower worlds in a horrible way, demanding occasional access to the preserved body, consuming the food offerings brought by priests and pious relatives to the mortuary chapel, and sometimes, as men whispered, 
taking its body or the wooden double always buried beside it and stalking noxiously abroad on errands peculiarly repellent. For thousands of years those bodies rested gorgeously encased and staring glassily upward when not visited by the K.A., awaiting the day when Osiris should restore both car and soul and lead forth the stiff legions of the dead from the sunken houses of sleep. It was to have been a glorious rebirth, but not all souls were approved, nor were all tombs inviolate, so that certain grotesque mistakes and fiendish abnormalities were to be looked for. Even today the Arabs murmur of unsanctified convocations and unwholesome worship in forgotten nether abysses which only winged invisible cars and soulless mummies may visit and return unscathed. Perhaps the most leeringly blood-congealing legends are those which relate to certain perverse products of decadent priestcraft, composite mummies made by the artificial union of human trunks and limbs with the heads of animals in imitation of the elder gods. At all stages of history, the sacred animals were mummified, so that consecrated bulls, cats, ibises, crocodiles and the like might return some day to greater glory. But only in the decadence did they mix the human and animal in the same mummy, only in the decadence, when they did not understand the rights and prerogatives of the K.A. and the soul. What happened to those composite mummies is not told of, at least publicly, and it is certain that no Egyptologist ever found one. The whispers of Arabs are very wild and cannot be relied upon. They even hint that old Kephren, he of the Sphinx, the Second Pyramid, and the yawning Gateway Temple, lives far underground wedded to the ghoul queen Nitocris and ruling over the mummies that are neither of man nor of beast. It was of these of Kephren and his consort and his strange armies of the hybrid dead that I dreamed, and that is why I am glad the exact dream shapes have faded from my memory. My most horrible vision was connected with an idle question I had asked myself the day before when looking at the great carven riddle of the desert and wondering with what unknown depths the temple so close to it might be secretly connected. That question so innocent and whimsical then, assumed in my dream a meaning of frenetic and hysterical madness. What huge and loathsome abnormality was the Sphinx originally carven to represent? My second awakening, if awakening it was, is a memory of stark hideousness which nothing else in my life, save one thing which came after, can parallel, and that life has been full and adventurous beyond most men's. Remember that I had lost consciousness whilst buried beneath a cascade of falling rope whose immensity revealed the cataclysmic depth of my present position. Now, as perception returned, I felt the entire weight gone and realised upon rolling over that although I was still tied, gagged and blindfolded, some agency had removed completely the suffocating hempen landslide which had overwhelmed me. The significance of this condition, of course, came to me only gradually, but even so I think it would have brought unconsciousness again had I not by this time reached such a state of emotional exhaustion that no new horror could make much difference. I was alone. With what? Before I could torture myself with any new reflection or make any fresh effort to escape from my bonds, an additional circumstance became manifest. Pains not formerly felt were racking my arms and legs, and I seemed coated with a profusion of dried blood beyond anything my former cuts and abrasions could furnish. My chest, too, seemed pierced by an hundred wounds, as though some malign titanic ibis had been pecking at it. Assuredly, the agency which had removed the rope was a hostile one, and had begun to wreak terrible injuries upon me when somehow impelled to desist, Yet at the time, my sensations were distinctly the reverse of what one might expect. Instead of sinking into a bottomless pit of despair, I was stirred to a new courage and action. For now I felt that the evil forces were physical things which a fearless man might encounter on an even basis. On the strength of this thought, I tugged again at my bonds and used all the art of a lifetime to free myself, as I had so often done amidst the glare of lights and the applause of vast crowds. The familiar details of my escaping process commenced to engross me, 
and now that the long rope was gone, I half regained my belief that the supreme horrors were hallucinations after all, and that there had never been any terrible shaft, measureless abyss, or interminable rope. Was I, after all, in the gateway temple of Kefren beside the Sphinx, and had the sneaking Arabs stolen in to torture me as I lay helpless there? At any rate, I must be free. Let me stand up unbound, ungagged, and with eyes open to catch any glimmer of light which might come trickling from any source, and I could actually delight in the combat against evil and treacherous foes. How long I took in shaking off my encumbrances I cannot tell. It must have been longer than in my exhibition performances, because I was wounded, exhausted, and enervated by the experiences I had passed through. When I was finally free, and taking deep breaths of a chill, damp, evilly spiced air all the more horrible when encountered without the screen of gag and blindfold edges, I found that I was too cramped and fatigued to move at once. There I lay, trying to stretch a frame, bent and mangled, for an indefinite period, and straining my eyes to catch a glimpse of some ray of light which would give a hint as to my position. By degrees my strength and flexibility returned, but my eyes beheld nothing. As I staggered to my feet, I peered diligently in every direction, yet met only an ebony blackness as great as that I had known when blindfolded. I tried my legs, blood encrusted beneath my shredded trousers, and found that I could walk, yet could not decide in what direction to go. Obviously I ought not to walk at random, and perhaps retreat directly from the entrance I sought. So I paused to note the direction of the cold, foetid, natron-scented air current which I had never ceased to feel. Accepting the point of its source as the possible entrance to the abyss, I strove to keep track of this landmark and to walk consistently toward it. I had had a matchbox with me, and even a small electric flashlight, but of course, the pockets of my tossed and tattered clothing were long since emptied of all heavy articles. As I walked cautiously in the blackness, the draught grew stronger and more offensive, till at length I could regard it as nothing less than a tangible stream of detestable vapour pouring out of some aperture like the smoke of the genie from the fisherman's jar in the eastern tale. The East. Egypt. Truly, this dark cradle of civilization was ever the wellspring of horrors and marvels unspeakable. The more I reflected on the nature of this cavern wind, the greater my sense of disquiet became. For although despite its odour I had sought its source as at least an indirect clue to the outer world, I now saw plainly that this foul emanation could have no admixture or connection whatsoever with the clean air of the Libyan desert, but must be essentially a thing vomited from sinister gulfs still lower down. I had, then, been walking in the wrong direction. After a moment's reflection, I decided not to retrace my steps. Away from the draft I would have no landmarks, for the roughly level rock floor was devoid of distinctive configurations. If, however, I followed up the strange current, I would undoubtedly arrive at an aperture of some sort, from whose gate I could perhaps work round the walls to the opposite side of this cyclopean and otherwise unnavigable hall. That I might fail, I well realised. I saw that this was no part of Kefren's gateway temple which tourists know, and it struck me that this particular hall might be unknown even to archaeologists, and merely stumbled upon by the inquisitive and malignant Arabs who had imprisoned me. If so, was there any present gate of escape to the known parts or to the outer air? What evidence indeed did I now possess that this was the gateway temple at all? For a moment, all my wildest speculations rushed back upon me, and I thought of that vivid melange of impressions, descent. Suspension in space, the rope, my wounds, and the dreams that were frankly dreams. Was this the end of life for me? Or indeed, would it be merciful if this moment were the end? I could answer none of my own questions, but merely kept on till fate for a third time reduced me to oblivion. This time there were no dreams, for the suddenness of the incident shocked me out of all thought, either conscious or subconscious. Tripping on an unexpected descending step at a point where the offensive draught became strong enough to offer an actual physical resistance, 
I was precipitated headlong down a black flight of huge stone stairs into a gulf of hideousness, unrelieved. That I ever breathed again is a tribute to the inherent vitality of the healthy human organism. Often I look back to that night and feel a touch of actual humour in those repeated lapses of consciousness. Lapses whose succession reminded me at the time of nothing more than the crude cinema melodramas of that period. Of course, it is possible that the repeated lapses never occurred, and that all the features of that underground nightmare were merely the dreams of one long coma which began with the shock of my descent into that abyss and ended with the healing balm of the outer air and of the rising sun which found me stretched on the sands of Giza before the sardonic and dawn-flushed face of the great Sphinx. I prefer to believe this latter explanation as much as I can, hence was glad when the police told me that the barrier to Kefren's gateway temple had been found unfastened, and that a sizable rift to the surface did actually exist in one corner of the still-buried part. I was glad, too, when the doctors pronounced my wounds only those to be expected from my seizure, blindfolding, lowering, struggling with bonds, falling some distance, perhaps into a depression in the temple's inner gallery, dragging myself to the outer barrier and escaping from it, and experiences like that, a very soothing diagnosis. And yet I know that there must be more than appears on the surface. That extreme descent is too vivid a memory to be dismissed, and it is odd that no one has ever been able to find a man answering the description of my guide, Abdul Reis El Drogman, the tomb-throated guide who looked and smiled like King Kefren. I have digressed from my connected narrative, perhaps in the vain hope of evading the telling of that final incident, that incident which of all is most certainly an hallucination, but I promise to relate it, and do not break promises. When I recovered, or seemed to recover, my senses after that fall down the black stone stairs, I was quite as alone and in darkness as before. The windy stench, bad enough before, was now fiendish, yet I had acquired enough familiarity by this time to bear it stoically. Dazedly, I began to crawl away from the place whence the putrid wind came, and with my bleeding hands felt the colossal blocks of a mighty pavement. Once my head struck against a hard object, and when I felt of it, I learned that it was the base of a column, a column of unbelievable immensity, whose surface was covered with gigantic chiseled hieroglyphics very perceptible to my touch. Crawling on, I encountered other titan columns at incomprehensible distances apart, when suddenly my attention was captured by the realisation of something which must have been impinging on my subconscious hearing long before the conscious sense was aware of it. From some still lower chasm in earth's bowels were proceeding certain sounds, measured and definite, and like nothing I had ever heard before. That they were very ancient and distinctly ceremonial, I felt almost intuitively, and much reading in Egyptology led me to associate them with the flute, the sambuke, the sistrum and the tympanum. In their rhythmic piping, droning, rattling and beating, I felt an element of terror beyond all the known terrors of earth, a terror peculiarly dissociated from personal fear and taking the form of a sort of objective pity for our planet that it should hold within its depths such horrors as must lie beyond these Egyptanic cacophonies. The sounds increased in volume and I felt that they were approaching. Then, and may all the gods of all pantheons unite to keep the like from my ears again, I began to hear, faintly and afar off, the morbid and millennial tramping of the marching things. It was hideous that footfalls so dissimilar should move in such perfect rhythm. The training of unhallowed thousands of years must lie behind that march of earth's inmost monstrosities. Padding, clicking, walking, stalking, rumbling, lumbering, crawling and all to the abhorrent discords of those mocking instruments. And then, God keep the memory of those Arab legends out of my head, the mummies without souls, the meeting place of the wandering Kays, the hordes of the devil-cursed pharaonic dead of forty centuries, the composite mummies led through the uttermost onyx voids by King Kefren and his ghoul queen Nitocris. The tramping drew nearer, 
Heaven save me from the sound of those feet and paws and hooves and pads and talons as it commenced to acquire detail. Down limitless reaches of sunless pavement, a spark of light flickered in the malodorous wind, and I drew behind the enormous circumference of a cyclopic column that I might escape for a while, the horror that was stalking million-footed toward me through gigantic hyperstyles of inhuman dread and phobic antiquity. The flickers increased, and the tramping and dissonant rhythm grew sickeningly loud. In the quivering orange light there stood faintly forth a scene of such stony awe that I gasped from a sheer wonder that conquered even fear and repulsion. Bases of columns whose middles were higher than human sight, mere bases of things that must each dwarf the Eiffel Tower to insignificance, hieroglyphics carved by unthinkable hands in caverns where daylight can be only a remote legend. I would not look at the marching things, that I desperately resolved as I heard their creaking joints and nitrous wheezing above the dead music and the dead tramping. It was merciful that they did not speak. But God! Their crazy torches began to cast shadows on the surface of those stupendous columns. Heaven, take it away! Hippopotami should not have human hands and carry torches. Men should not have the heads of crocodiles. I tried to turn away, but the shadows and the sounds and the stench were everywhere. Then I remembered something I used to do in half-conscious nightmares as a boy and began to repeat to myself, This is a dream. This is a dream. But it was of no use, and I could only shut my eyes and pray. At least, that is what I think I did, for one is never sure in visions, and I know this can have been nothing more. I wondered whether I should ever reach the world again, and at times would furtively open my eyes to see if I could discern any feature of the place other than the wind of spiced putrefaction, the topless columns, and the thaumatropically grotesque shadows of abnormal horror. The sputtering glare of multiplying torches now shone, and unless this hellish place were wholly without walls, I could not fail to see some boundary or fixed landmark soon. But I had to shut my eyes again when I realized how many of the things were assembling, and when I glimpsed a certain object walking solemnly and steadily without any body above the waist. A fiendish and ululant corpse gurgle or death rattle now split the very atmosphere, the charnel atmosphere poisonous with naphtha and bitumen blasts, in one concerted chorus from the ghoulish legion of hybrid blasphemies. My eyes, perversely shaken open, gazed for an instant upon a sight which no human creature could even imagine without panic fear and physical exhaustion. The things had filed ceremonially in one direction, the direction of the noisome wind, where the light of their torches shewed their bended heads, or the bended heads of such as had heads. They were worshipping before a great black, footer-belching aperture which reached up almost out of sight and which I could see was flanked at right angles by two giant staircases whose ends were far away in shadow. One of these was indubitably the staircase I had fallen down. The dimensions of the whole were fully in proportion with those of the columns. An ordinary house would have been lost in it, and any average public building could easily have been moved in and out. It was so vast a surface that only by moving the eye could one trace its boundaries so vast, so hideously black, and so aromatically stinking. Directly in front of this yawning Polyphemus door, the things were throwing objects, evidently sacrifices or religious offerings, to judge by their gestures. Kefren was their leader, sneering King Kefren or the guide Abdul Race, crowned with a golden shent and intoning endless formulae with the hollow voice of the dead. By his side knelt beautiful Queen Nitocris, whom I saw in profile for a moment, noting that the right half of her face was eaten away by rats or other ghouls, and I shut my eyes again when I saw what objects were being thrown as offerings to the foated aperture or its possible local deity. It occurred to me that judging from the elaborateness of this worship, the concealed deity must be one of considerable importance. Was it Osiris or Isis? Horus or Anubis, or some vast unknown god of the dead, still more central and supreme. 
There is a legend that terrible altars and colossi were reared to an unknown one before ever the known gods were worshipped. And now, as I steeled myself to watch the rapt and sepulchral adorations of those nameless things, a thought of escape flashed upon me. The hall was dim, and the columns heavy with shadow. With every creature of that nightmare throng absorbed in shocking raptures, it might be barely possible for me to creep past to the faraway end of one of the staircases and ascend unseen, trusting to fate and skill to deliver me from the upper reaches. Where I was, I neither knew nor seriously reflected upon, and for a moment it struck me as amusing to plan a serious escape from that which I knew to be a dream. Was I in some hidden and unsuspected lower realm of Kefren's gateway temple, that temple which generations have persistently called the Temple of the Sphinx? I could not conjecture, but I resolved to ascend to life and consciousness if wit and muscle could carry me. Wriggling flat on my stomach, I began the anxious journey toward the foot of the left-hand staircase, which seemed the more accessible of the two. I cannot describe the incidents and sensations of that crawl, but they may be guessed when one reflects on what I had to watch steadily in that malign, wind-blown torchlight in order to avoid detection. The bottom of the staircase was, as I have said, far away in shadow, as it had to be to rise without a bend to the dizzy, parapeted landing above the titanic aperture. This placed the last stages of my crawl at some distance from the noisome herd, though the spectacle chilled me even when quite remote at my right. At length I succeeded in reaching the steps and began to climb, keeping close to the wall on which I observed decorations of the most hideous sort and relying for safety on the absorbed, ecstatic interest with which the monstrosities watched the foul-breezed aperture and the impious objects of nourishment they had flung on the pavement before it. Though the staircase was huge and steep, fashioned of vast porphyry blocks as if for the feet of a giant, the ascent seemed virtually interminable. Dread of discovery and the pain which renewed exercise had brought to my wounds combined to make that upward crawl a thing of agonizing memory. I had intended, on reaching the landing, to climb immediately onward along whatever upper staircase might mount from there stopping for no last look at the carrion abominations that poured and genuflected some seventy or eighty feet below, yet a sudden repetition of that thunderous corpse-gurgle and death-rattle chorus, coming as I had nearly gained the top of the flight, and shewing by its ceremonial rhythm that it was not an alarm of my discovery, caused me to pause and peer cautiously over the parapet. The monstrosities were hailing something which had poked itself out of the nauseous aperture to seize the hellish fare proffered it. It was something quite ponderous, even as seen from my height, something yellowish and hairy, and endowed with a sort of nervous motion. It was as large, perhaps, as a good-sized hippopotamus, but very curiously shaped. It seemed to have no neck, but five separate shaggy heads springing in a row from a roughly cylindrical trunk, the first very small, the second good-sized, the third and fourth equal and largest of all, and the fifth rather small, though not so small as the first. Out of these heads darted curious, rigid tentacles, which seized ravenously on the excessively great quantities of unmentionable food placed before the aperture. Once in a while the thing would leap up, and occasionally it would retreat into its den in a very odd manner. Its locomotion was so inexplicable that I stared in fascination, wishing it would emerge further from the cavernous lair beneath me. Then it did emerge. It did emerge. And at the sight, I turned and fled into the darkness up the higher staircase that rose behind me, fled unknowingly up incredible steps and ladders and inclined planes to which no human sight or logic guided me, and which I must ever relegate to the world of dreams for want of any confirmation. It must have been dream, or the dawn would never have found me breathing on the sands of Giza before the sardonic, dawn-flushed face of the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx? God, that idle question I asked myself on that sun-blessed morning before. What huge and loathsome abnormality was the Sphinx originally carven to represent? 
Accursed is the sight, be it in dream or not, that revealed to me the supreme horror, the unknown god of the dead, which licks its colossal chops in the unsuspected abyss, fed hideous morsels by soulless absurdities that should not exist. The five-headed monster that emerged, that five-headed monster as large as a hippopotamus, the five-headed monster, and that of which it is the merest forepaw. But I survived, and I know it was only a dream. The Colour Out of Space by H. P. Lovecraft West of Arkham the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark, narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically, and where thin brooklets trickle without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentler slopes there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over old New England secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingled sides bulging perilously beneath low, gambrel roofs. The old folk have gone away, and foreigners do not like to live there. French Canadians have tried it, Italians have tried it, and the Poles have come and departed. It is not because of anything that can be seen or heard or handled, but because of something that is imagined. The place is not good for imagination and does not bring restful dreams at night. It must be this which keeps the foreigners away, for old Ami Pierce has never told them of anything he recalls from the strange days. Ami, whose head has been a little queer for years, is the only one who still remains, or who ever talks of the strange days and he dares to do this because his house is so near the open fields and the travelled roads around Arkham. There was once a road over the hills and through the valleys that ran straight where the blasted heath is now, but people ceased to use it, and a new road was laid curving far toward the south. Traces of the old one can still be found amidst the weeds of a returning wilderness, and some of them will doubtless linger even when half the hollows are flooded for the new reservoir. Then the dark woods will be cut down and the blasted heath will slumber far below blue waters whose surface will mirror the sky and ripple in the sun. And the secrets of the strange days will be one with the deep's secrets, one with the hidden lore of old ocean and all the mystery of primal earth. When I went into the hills and vales to survey for the new reservoir, they told me the place was evil. They told me this in Arkham, and because that is a very old town full of witch legends, I thought the evil must be something which grandmas had whispered to children through centuries. The name Blasted Heath seemed to me very odd and theatrical, and I wondered how it had come into the folklore of a Puritan people. Then I saw that dark westward tangle of glens and slopes for myself, and ceased to wonder at anything besides its own elder mystery. It was morning when I saw it, but shadow lurked always there. The trees grew too thickly, and their trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood. There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and the floor was too soft with the dank moss and mattings of infinite years of decay. In the open spaces, mostly along the line of the old road, there were little hillside farms, sometimes with all the buildings standing, sometimes with only one or two and sometimes with only a lone chimney or fast-filling cellar. Weeds and briars reigned, and furtive wild things rustled in the undergrowth. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective or chiaroscuro were awry. I did not wonder that the foreigners would not stay, for this was no region to sleep in. It was too much like a landscape of Salvator Rosa, too much like some forbidden woodcut in a tale of terror. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. I knew it the moment I came upon it at the bottom of a spacious valley, for no other name could fit such thing, or any other thing fit such a name. 
It was as if the poet had coined the phrase from having seen this one particular region. It must, I thought as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over those five acres of grey desolation that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields? It lay largely to the north of the ancient road line, but encroached a little on the other side. I felt an odd reluctance about approaching, and did so at last only because my business took me through and past it. There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine grey dust or ash, which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead trunks stood or lay rotting at the rim. As I walked hurriedly by, I saw the tumbled bricks and stones of an old chimney and cellar on my right, and the yawning black moor of an abandoned well, whose stagnant vapours played strange tricks with the hues of the sunlight. Even the long, dark woodland climb beyond seemed welcome in contrast, and I marvelled no more at the frightened whispers of Arkham people. There had been no house or ruin near, even in the old days the place must have been lonely and remote. And at twilight, dreading to repass that ominous spot, I walked circuitously back to the town by the curving road on the south. I vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an odd timidity about the deep sky voids above had crept into my soul. In the evening, I asked old people in Arkham about the blasted heath, and what was meant by that phrase, strange days, which so many evasively muttered. I could not, however, get any good answers, except that all the mystery was much more recent than I had dreamed. It was not a matter of old legendary at all, but something within the lifetime of those who spoke. It had happened in the eighties, and a family had disappeared or was killed. Speakers would not be exact, and because they all told me to pay no attention to old Amy Pierce's crazy tales, I sought him out the next morning, having heard that he lived alone in the ancient tottering cottage where the trees first begin to get very thick. It was a fearsomely ancient place, and had begun to exude the faint miasmal odour which clings about houses that have stood too long. Only with persistent knocking could I rouse the aged man, and when he shuffled timidly to the door, I could tell he was not glad to see me. He was not so feeble as I had expected, but his eyes drooped in a curious way, and his unkempt clothing and white beard made him seem very worn and dismal. Not knowing just how he could best be launched on his tales, I feigned a matter of business, told him of my surveying, and asked vague questions about the district. He was far brighter and more educated than I had been led to think, and before I knew it had grasped quite as much of the subject as any man I had talked with in Arkham. He was not like other rustics I had known in the sections where reservoirs were to be. From him there were no protests at the miles of old wood and farmland to be blotted out, though perhaps there would have been had not his home lain outside the bounds of the future lake. Relief was all that he showed, relief at the doom of the dark ancient valleys through which he had roamed all his life. They were better under water now, better under water since the strange days. And with this opening, his husky voice sank low, while his body leaned forward, and his right forefinger began to point shakily and impressively. It was then that I heard the story, and as the rambling voice scraped and whispered on, I shivered again and again despite the summer day. Often I had to recall the speaker from ramblings, piece out scientific points which he knew only by a fading parrot memory of professor's talk or bridge over gaps where his sense of logic and continuity broke down. When he was done, I did not wonder that his mind had snapped a trifle or that the folk of Arkham would not speak much of the blasted heath. I hurried back before sunset to my hotel, unwilling to have the stars come out above me in the open, and the next day returned to Boston to give up my position. I could not go into that dim chaos of old forest and slope again, or face another time that grey, blasted heath where the black well yawned deep beside the tumbled bricks and stones. The reservoir will soon be built now, and all those elder secrets will lie safe forever under watery fathoms. But even then I do not believe I would like to visit that country by night, at least not when the sinister stars are out and nothing could bribe me to drink the new city water of Arkham.
It all began, old Ami said, with the meteorite. Before that time, there had been no wild legends at all since the witch trials, and even then these western woods were not feared half so much as the small island in the Miskatonic where the devil held court beside a curious stone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dusk was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white noontide cloud, that string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and bedded itself in the ground beside the well at the Nahum Gardner place. That was the house which had stood where the blasted heath was to come, the trim, white Nahum Gardner house amidst its fertile gardens and orchards. Nahum had come to town to tell people about the stone and had dropped in at Amy Pierce's on the way. Amy was forty then, and all the queer things were fixed very strongly in his mind. He and his wife had gone with the three professors from Miskatonic University, who hastened out the next morning to see the weird visitor from unknown stellar space, and had wondered why Nahum had called it so large the day before. It had shrunk, Nahum said, as he pointed out the big brownish mound above the ripped earth and charred grass near the archaic well sweep in his front yard. But the wise men answered that stones do not shrink. Its heat lingered persistently, and Nahum declared it had glowed faintly in the night. The professors tried it with a geologist's hammer and found it was oddly soft. It was, in truth, so soft as to be almost plastic, and they gouged rather than chipped a specimen to take back to the college for testing. They took it in an old pail borrowed from Nahum's kitchen, for even the small piece refused to grow cool. On the trip back, they stopped at Amy's to rest, and seemed thoughtful when Mrs. Pierce remarked that the fragment was growing smaller and burning the bottom of the pail. Truly, it was not large, but perhaps they had taken less than they thought. The day after that, all this was in June of 82, the professors had trooped out again in a great excitement. As they passed Amy's, they told him what queer things the specimen had done, and how it had faded wholly away when they put it in a glass beaker. The beaker had gone too, and the wise men talked of the strange stone's affinity for silicon. It had acted quite unbelievably in that well-ordered laboratory, doing nothing at all and showing no occluded gases when heated on charcoal, being wholly negative in the borax bead, and soon proving itself absolutely non-volatile at any producible temperature, including that of the oxyhydrogen blowpipe. On an anvil, it appeared highly malleable, and in the dark, its luminosity was very marked. Stubbornly refusing to grow cool, it soon had the college in a state of real excitement, and when upon heating before the spectroscope, it displayed shining bands unlike any known colours of the normal spectrum, there was much breathless talk of new elements, bizarre optical properties, and other things which puzzled men of science are wont to say when faced by the unknown. Hot as it was, they tested it in a crucible with all the proper regions. Water did nothing. Hydrochloric acid was the same. Nitric acid and even aqua regia merely hissed and spattered against its torrid invulnerability. Amy had difficulty in recalling all these things, but recognised some solvents as I mentioned them in the usual order of use. There were ammonia and caustic soda, alcohol and ether, nauseous carbon disulfide and a dozen others. But although the weight grew steadily less as time passed, and the fragment seemed to be slightly cooling, there was no change in the solvents to show that they had attacked the substance at all. It was a metal, though, beyond a doubt. It was magnetic, for one thing, and after its immersion in the acid solvents, there seemed to be faint traces of the Wiedmenstetten figures found on meteoric iron. When the cooling had grown very considerable, the testing was carried on in glass, and it was in a glass beaker that they left all the chips made of the original fragment during the work. The next morning, both chips and beaker were gone without trace, and only a charred spot marked the place on the wooden shelf where they had been. All this the professors told Amy as they paused at his door, and once more he went with them to see the stony messenger from the stars, 
though this time his wife did not accompany him. It had now most certainly shrunk, and even the sober professors could not doubt the truth of what they saw. All around the dwindling brown lump near the well was a vacant space, except where the earth had caved in. And whereas it had been a good seven feet across the day before, it was now scarcely five. It was still hot, and the sages studied its surface curiously as they detached another and larger piece with hammer and chisel. They gouged deeply this time, and as they pried away the smaller mass, they saw that the core of the thing was not quite homogeneous. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large coloured globule embedded in the substance. The colour, which resembled some of the bands in the meteor's strange spectrum, was almost impossible to describe, and it was only by analogy that they called it colour at all. Its texture was glossy, and upon tapping it appeared to promise both brittleness and hollowness. One of the professors gave it a smart blow with a hammer, and it burst with a nervous little pop. Nothing was emitted, and all trace of the thing vanished with the puncturing. It left behind a hollow spherical space about three inches across, and all thought it probable that others would be discovered as the enclosing substance wasted away. Conjecture was vain, so after a futile attempt to find additional globules by drilling, the seekers left again with their new specimen, which proved, however, as baffling in the laboratory as its predecessor. Aside from being almost plastic, having heat, magnetism, and slight luminosity, cooling slightly in powerful acids, possessing an unknown spectrum, wasting away in air, and attacking silicon compounds with mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. And at the end of the tests, the college scientists were forced to own that they could not place it. It was nothing of this earth, but a piece of the great outside and as such, dowered with outside properties and obedient to outside laws. That night, there was a thunderstorm, and when the professors went out to Nahum's the next day, they met with a bitter disappointment. The stone, magnetic as it had been, must have had some peculiar electrical property, for it had drawn the lightning, as Nahum said, with a singular persistence. Six times within an hour, the farmer saw the lightning strike the furrow in the front yard, and when the storm was over, nothing remained but a ragged pit by the ancient well sweep, half chocked with caved-in earth. Digging had borne no fruit, and the scientists verified the fact of the utter vanishment. The failure was total, so that nothing was left to do but go back to the laboratory and test again the disappearing fragment left carefully cased in lead. That fragment lasted a week, at the end of which nothing of value had been learned of it. When it had gone, no residue was left behind, and in time the professors felt scarcely sure they had indeed seen with the waking eyes that cryptic vestige of the fathomless gulfs outside, that lone, weird message from other universes and other realms of matter, force, and entity. As was natural, the Arkham papers made much of the incident with its collegiate sponsoring and sent reporters to talk with Nahum Gardner and his family. At least one Boston daily also sent a scribe, and Nahum quickly became a kind of local celebrity. He was a lean, genial person of about fifty, living with his wife and three sons on the pleasant farmstead in the valley. He and Amy exchanged visits frequently, as did their wives, and Amy had nothing but praise for him after all these years. He seemed slightly proud of the notice his place had attracted, and talked often of the meteorite in the succeeding weeks. That July and August were hot, and Nahum worked hard at his haying in the ten-acre pasture across Chapman's Brook, his rattling wain wearing deep ruts in the shadowy lanes between. The labour tired him more than it had in other years, and he felt that age was beginning to tell on him. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. The pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchards were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwonted gloss, and in such abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop. But with the ripening came sore disappointment, for of all that gorgeous array of specious lusciousness, not one single jot was fit to eat. 
Into the fine flavour of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness, so that even the smallest of bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with the melons and tomatoes, and Nahum sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the soil and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland lot along the road. Winter came early and was very cold. Ami saw Nahum less often than usual and observed that he had begun to look worried. The rest of his family, too, seemed to have grown taciturn and were far from steady in their church-going or their attendance at the various social events of the countryside. For this reserve or melancholy, no cause could be found, though all the household confessed now and then to poorer health and a feeling of vague disquiet. Nahum himself gave the most definite statement of anyone when he said he was disturbed about certain footprints in the snow. They were the usual winter prints of red squirrels, white rabbits and foxes, but the brooding farmer professed to see something not quite right about their nature and arrangement. He was never specific, but appeared to think that they were not as characteristic of the anatomy and habits of squirrels and rabbits and foxes as they ought to be. Ami listened without interest to this talk until one night when he drove past Nahum's house in his sleigh on the way back from Clark's Corners. There had been a moon, and a rabbit had run across the road, and the leaps of that rabbit were longer than either Ami or his horse liked. The latter, indeed, had almost run away when brought up by a firm rain. Thereafter, Ami gave Nahum's tales more respect, and wondered why the gardener dog seemed so cowed and quivering every morning. They had, it developed, nearly lost the spirit to bark. In February, the McGregor boys from Meadow Hill were out shooting woodchucks, and not far from the gardener place bagged a very peculiar specimen. The proportions of its body seemed slightly altered in a queer way impossible to describe, while its face had taken on an expression which no one ever saw in a woodchuck before. The boys were genuinely frightened and threw the thing away at once so that only their grotesque tales of it ever reached the people of the countryside. But the shying of horses near Nahum's house had now become an acknowledged thing, and all the basis for a cycle of whispered legend was fast taking form. People vowed that the snow melted faster around Nahum's than it did anywhere else, and early in March there was an awed discussion in Potter's general store at Clark's Corners. Stephen Rice had driven past gardeners in the morning and had noticed the skunk cabbages coming up through the mud by the woods across the road. Never were things of such size seen before, and they held strange colours that could not be put into any words. Their shapes were monstrous, and the horse had snorted at an odour which struck Stephen as wholly unprecedented. That afternoon, several persons drove past to see the abnormal growth, and all agreed that plants of that kind ought never to sprout in a healthy world. The bad fruit of the fall before was freely mentioned, and it went from mouth to mouth that there was poison in Nahum's ground. Of course, it was the meteorite, and remembering how strange the men from the college had found that stone to be, several farmers spoke about the matter to them. One day they paid Nahum a visit, but having no love of wild tales and folklore, were very conservative in what they inferred. The plants were certainly odd, but all skunk cabbages are more or less odd in shape and hue. Perhaps some mineral element from the stone had entered the soil, but it would soon be washed away. And as for the footprints and frightened horses, of course this was mere country talk which such a phenomenon as the aerolite would be certain to start. There was really nothing for serious men to do in cases of wild gossip, for superstitious rustics will say and believe anything. And so all through the strange days the professors stayed away in contempt. Only one of them, when given two files of dust for analysis in a police job over a year and a half later, recalled that the queer colour of that skunk cabbage had been very like one of the anomalous bands of light shown by the meteor fragment in the college spectroscope, and like the brittle globule found embedded in the stone from the abyss. The samples in this analysis case gave the same odd bands at first, though later they lost the property. The trees budded prematurely around Nahum's, and at night they swayed ominously in the wind. 
Nahum's second son Thaddeus, a lad of fifteen, swore that they swayed also when there was no wind, but even the gossips would not credit this. Certainly, however, restlessness was in the air. The entire Gardner family developed the habit of stealthy listening, though not for any sound which they could consciously name. The listening was, indeed, rather a product of moments when consciousness seemed half to slip away. Unfortunately, such moments increased week by week, till it became common speech that something was wrong with all Nahum's folks. When the early saxifrage came out, it had another strange colour, not quite like that of the skunk cabbage, but plainly related and equally unknown to anyone who saw it. Nahum took some blossoms to Arkham and showed them to the editor of the Gazette, but that dignitary did no more than write a humorous article about them in which the dark fears of rustics were held up to polite ridicule. It was a mistake of Nahum's to tell a stolid city man about the way the great, overgrown morning cloak butterflies behaved in connection with these saxifrages. April brought a kind of madness to the country folk and began that disuse of the road past Nahum's which led to its ultimate abandonment. It was next the vegetation. All the orchard trees blossomed forth in strange colours, and through the stony soil of the yard and adjacent pasturage there sprang up a bizarre growth, which only a botanist could connect with the proper flora of the region. No sane, wholesome colours were anywhere to be seen except in the green grass and leafage, but everywhere were those hectic and prismatic variants of some diseased, underlying primary tone without a place among the known tints of earth. The Dutchman's breeches became a thing of sinister menace, and the blood roots grew insolent in their chromatic perversion. Amy and the gardeners thought that most of the colours had a sort of haunting familiarity and decided that they reminded one of the brittle globule in the meteor. Nahum ploughed and sowed the ten-acre pasture and the upland lot, but did nothing with the land around the house. He knew it would be of no use, and hoped that the summer's strange growths would draw all the poison from the soil. He was prepared for almost anything now, and had grown used to the sense of something near him waiting to be heard. The shunning of his house by neighbours told on him, of course, but it told on his wife more. The boys were better off, being at school each day, but they could not help being frightened by the gossip. Thaddeus, an especially sensitive youth, suffered the most. In May, the insects came, and Nahum's place became a nightmare of buzzing and crawling. Most of the creatures seemed not quite usual in their aspects and motions, and their nocturnal habits contradicted all former experience. The gardeners took to watching at night, watching in all directions at random for something they could not tell what. It was then that they all owned that Thaddeus had been right about the trees. Mrs. Gardner was the next to see it from the window as she watched the swollen boughs of a maple against a moonlit sky. The boughs surely moved, and there was no wind. It must be the sap. Strangeness had come into everything growing now, yet it was none of Nahum's family at all who made the next discovery. Familiarity had dulled them, and what they could not see was glimpsed by a timid windmill salesman from Bolton who drove by one night in ignorance of the country legends. What he told in Arkham was given a short paragraph in the Gazette, and it was there that all the farmers, Nahum included, saw it first. The night had been dark and the buggy lamps faint, but around a farm in the valley which everyone knew from the account must be Nahum's, the darkness had been less thick. A dim though distinct luminosity seemed to inhere in all the vegetation, grass, leaves and blossoms alike, while at one moment a detached piece of the phosphorescence appeared to stir furtively in the yard near the barn. The grass had so far seemed untouched, and the cows were freely pastured in the lot near the house, but toward the end of May the milk began to be bad. Then Nahum had the cows driven to the uplands, after which this trouble ceased. Not long after this the change in grass and leaves became apparent to the eye. All the verdure was going grey and was developing a highly singular quality of brittleness. Amy was now the only person who ever visited the place, and his visits were becoming fewer and fewer. When school closed, the gardeners were virtually cut off from the world, 
and sometimes let Amy do their errands in town. They were failing curiously, both physically and mentally, and no one was surprised when the news of Mrs. Gardner's madness stole around. It happened in June, about the anniversary of the meteor's fall, and the poor woman screamed about things in the air which she could not describe. In her raving, there was not a single specific noun, but only verbs and pronouns. Things moved and changed and fluttered, and ears tingled to impulses which were not wholly sounds. Something was taken away. She was being drained of something. Something was fastening itself on her that ought not to be. Someone must make it keep off. Nothing was ever still in the night. The walls and windows shifted. Nahum did not send her to the county asylum, but let her wander about the house as long as she was harmless to herself and others. Even when her expression changed, he did nothing. But when the boys grew afraid of her, and Thaddeus nearly fainted at the way she made faces at him, he decided to keep her locked in the attic. By July, she had ceased to speak and crawled on all fours, and before that month was over, Nahum got the mad notion that she was slightly luminous in the dark, as he now clearly saw was the case with the nearby vegetation. It was a little before this that the horses had stampeded. Something had aroused them in the night, and their neighing and kicking in their stalls had been terrible. There seemed virtually nothing to do to calm them, and when Nahum opened the stable door, they all bolted out like frightened woodland deer. It took a week to track all four, and when found, they were seen to be quite useless and unmanageable. Something had snapped in their brains, and each one had to be shot for its own good. Nahum borrowed a horse from Ami for his haying, but found it would not approach the barn. It shied, balked, and whinnied, and in the end he could do nothing but drive it into the yard, while the men used their own strength to get the heavy wagon near enough the hayloft for convenient pitching. And all the while the vegetation was turning grey and brittle. Even the flowers whose hues had been so strange were greying now, and the fruit was coming out grey and dwarfed and tasteless. The asters and goldenrod bloomed grey and distorted, and the roses and zinnias and hollyhocks in the front yard were such blasphemous-looking things that Nahum's oldest boy, Zenus, cut them down. The strangely puffed insects died about that time, even the bees that had left their hives and taken to the woods. By September, all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a greyish powder, and Nahum feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. His wife now had spells of terrific screaming, and he and the boys were in a constant state of nervous tension. They shunned people now, and when school opened, the boys did not go. But it was Ami, on one of his rare visits, who first realised that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly fetid, nor exactly salty, and Ami advised his friend to dig another well on higher ground to use till the soil was good again. Nam, however, ignored the warning, for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meagre and ill-cooked meals and did their thankless and monotonous chores through the aimless days. There was something of stolid resignation about them all, as if they walked half in another world between lines of nameless guards to a certain and familiar doom. Thaddeus went mad in September after a visit to the well. He had gone with a pail and had come back empty-handed, shrieking and waving his arms, and sometimes lapsing into an inane titter or a whisper about the moving colours down there. Two in one family was pretty bad, but Nahum was very brave about it. He let the boy run about for a week until he began stumbling and hurting himself, and then he shut him in an attic room across the hall from his mother's. The way they screamed at each other from behind their locked doors was very terrible, especially to little Merwin, who fancied they talked in some terrible language that was not of earth. Merwin was getting frightfully imaginative, and his restlessness was worse after the shutting away of the brother who had been his greatest playmate. Almost at the same time the mortality among the livestock commenced. Poultry turned greyish and died very quickly, their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinately fat, 
then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was of course useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. The swine began growing grey and brittle and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas or sometimes the whole body would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a greying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease, yet what disease could wreak such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place, for the stock and poultry were dead and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed since there now seemed to be no mice, and only Mrs. Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. On the 19th of October, Nahum staggered into Amy's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in a way which could not be told. Nahum had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm and had put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact, but it was much as it had been in the barn. Amy and his wife consoled the stricken man as best they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling round the gardeners, and all they touched, and the very presence of one in the house was a breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Amy accompanied Nahum home with the greatest reluctance, and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing of little Merwin. Zenus needed no calming. He had come of late to do nothing but stare into space and obey what his father told him, and Amy thought that his fate was very merciful. Now and then, Merwin's screams were answered faintly from the attic, and in response to an inquiring look, Nahum said that his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Amy managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began and the trees may or may not have swayed without wind. It was really lucky for Ami that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly, but had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have turned a total maniac. In the twilight, he hastened home, the screams of the mad woman and the nervous child ringing horrible in his ears. Three days later, Nahum burst into Amy's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more, while Mrs. Pierce listened in a clutching fright. It was little Merwin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and pail for water, and had never come back. He'd been going to pieces for days, and hardly knew what he was about, screamed at everything. There had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the father could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and of the child himself, no trace. At the time, Nahum thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came, and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he had found some very curious things near the well. There was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron, which had certainly been the lantern, while a bent pail and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Nahum was past imagining, Mrs. Pierce was blank, and Amy, when he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone, and there would be no use in telling the people around, who shunned all gardeners now. No use, either, in telling the city people at Arkham, who laughed at everything. 
Thad was gone, and now Merwin was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and heard. Nahum would go soon, and he wanted Ami to look after his wife and Zenus if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though he could not fancy what for, since he had always walked uprightly in the Lord's ways so far as he knew. For over two weeks, Ami saw nothing of Nahum, and then, worried about what might have happened, he overcame his fears and paid the gardener place a visit. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment the visitor was apprehensive of the worst. The aspect of the whole farm was shocking, greyish withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines falling in brittle wreckage from archaic walls and gables, and great bare trees clawing up at the grey November sky with a studied malevolence which Ami could not but feel had come from some subtle change in the tilt of the branches. But Nahum was alive after all. He was weak and lying in a couch in the low-sealed kitchen, but perfectly conscious and able to give simple orders to Zenus. The room was deadly cold, and as Ami visibly shivered, the host shouted huskily to Zenus for more wood. Wood, indeed, was sorely needed, since the cavernous fireplace was unlit and empty, with a cloud of soot blowing about in the chill wind that came down the chimney. Presently, Nahum asked him if the extra wood had made him any more comfortable, and then Ami saw what had happened. The stoutest cord had broken at last, and the hapless farmer's mind was proof against more sorrow. Questioning tactfully, Ami could get no clear data at all about the missing Zenus. In the well, he lives in the well, was all that the clouded father would say. Then there flashed across the visitor's mind a sudden thought of the mad wife, and he changed his line of inquiry. Nabby, why, here she is, was the surprised response of poor Nahum, and Ami soon saw that he must search for himself. Leaving the harmless babbler on the couch, he took the keys from their nail beside the door and climbed the creaking stairs to the attic. It was very close and noisome up there, and no sound could be heard from any direction. Of the four doors in sight, only one was locked, and on this he tried various keys on the ring he had taken. The third key proved the right one, and after some fumbling, Ami threw open the low white door. It was quite dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by the crude wooden bars and Ami could see nothing at all on the wide, planked floor. The stench was beyond enduring, and before proceeding further, he had to retreat to another room and return with his lungs filled with breathable air. When he did enter, he saw something dark in the corner, and upon seeing it more clearly, he screamed outright. While he screamed, he thought a momentary cloud eclipsed the window, and a second later he felt himself brushed as if by some hateful current of vapour. Strange colours danced before his eyes, and had not a present horror numbed him, he would have thought of the globule in the meteor that the geologist's hammer had shattered, and of the morbid vegetation that had sprouted in the spring. As it was, he thought only of the blasphemous monstrosity which confronted him, and which all too clearly had shared the nameless fate of young Thaddeus and the livestock. But the terrible thing about the horror was that it very slowly and perceptibly moved as it continued to crumble. Ami would give me no added particulars of this scene, but the shape in the corners does not reappear in his tale as a moving object. There are things which cannot be mentioned, and what is done in common humanity is sometimes cruelly judged by the law. I gathered that no moving thing was left in that attic room, and that to leave anything capable of motion there would have been a deed so monstrous as to damn any accountable being to eternal torment. Anyone but a stolid farmer would have fainted or gone mad, but Ami walked conscious through that low doorway and locked the accursed secret behind him. There would be Nahum to deal with now. He must be fed and tended and removed to some place where he could be cared for. Commencing his descent of the dark stairs, Ami heard a thud below him. He even thought a scream had been suddenly choked off and recalled nervously the clammy vapour which had brushed by him in that frightful room above. What presence had his cry and entry started up? 
halted by some vague fear, he heard still further sounds below. Indubitably, there was a sort of heavy dragging, and a most detestably sticky noise as of some fiendish and unclean species of suction. With an associative sense goaded to feverish heights, he thought unaccountably of what he had seen upstairs. Good God, what eldritch dream world was this into which he had blundered? He dared move neither backward nor forward, but stood there trembling at the black curve of the boxed-in staircase. Every trifle of the scene burned itself into his brain. The sounds, the sense of dread expectancy, the darkness, the steepness of the narrow steps, and merciful heaven, the faint but unmistakable luminosity of all the woodwork in sight, steps, sides, exposed laths, and beams alike. Then there burst forth a frantic whinny from Amy's horse outside, followed at once by a clatter which told of a frenzied runaway. In another moment, horse and buggy had gone beyond earshot, leaving the frightened man on the dark stairs to guess what had sent them. But that was not all. There had been another sound out there, a sort of liquid splash, water. It must have been the well. He had left Hero untied near it, and a buggy wheel must have brushed the coping and knocked in a stone. And still the pale phosphorescence glowed in that detestably ancient woodwork. God, how old the house was. Most of it built before 1700. A feeble scratching on the floor downstairs now sounded distinctly, and Amy's grip tightened on a heavy stick he had picked up in the attic for some purpose. Slowly nerving himself, he finished his descent and walked boldly toward the kitchen. But he did not complete the walk, because what he sought was no longer there. It had come to meet him, and it was still alive after a fashion. Whether it had crawled, or whether it had been dragged by any external forces, Amy could not say, but the death had been at it. Everything had happened in the last half hour, but collapse, greying and disintegration were already far advanced. There was a horrible brittleness, and dry fragments were scaling off. Amy could not touch it, but looked horrifiedly into the distorted parody that had been a face. What was it, Nahum? What was it? he whispered and the cleft, bulging lips were just able to crackle out a final answer. Nothing. Nothing. The colour. It burns. Cold and wet. But it burns. It lived in the well. I seen it. A kind of smoke. Just like the flowers last spring. The well shone at night. Thad and Merwin and Zenus. Everything alive. Suck in the life out of everything. In that stone. It must have come in that stone, pits in the whole place. Don't know what it wants. That round thing their men from the college dug out in the stone. They smashed it. It was that same colour. Just the same, like the flowers and plants. Must have been more of them. Seeds, seeds. They growed. I seen it the fuss time this week. Must have got strong on Zenus. He was a big boy, full of life. It beats down your mind and then gits ye, burns ye up, in the well water. You was right about that. Evil water. Zenus never come back from the well. Can't get away. Draws ye. You know, summit's coming, but taint no use. I seen it time, and again Zenus was took. Was nabby, Amy. My head's no good. Don't know how long since I fed her. It'll get her EF we ain't careful. Just a colour. Her face is getting to have that colour sometimes towards night, and it burns and sucks. It come from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. He was right. Look out, Amy. It'll do something more. Sucks the life out. But that was all. That which spoke could speak no more because it had completely caved in. Amy laid a red-checked tablecloth over what was left and reeled out the back door into the fields. He climbed the slope to the ten-acre pasture and stumbled home by the north road and the woods. He could not pass that well from which his horses had run away. He had looked at it through the window and had seen that no stone was missing from the rim. Then the lurching buggy had not dislodged anything after all. The splash had been something else something which went into the well after it had done with poor Nahum. 
When Ami reached his house, the horses and buggy had arrived before him and thrown his wife into fits of anxiety. Reassuring her without explanations, he set out at once for Arkham and notified the authorities that the Gardner family was no more. He indulged in no details, but merely told of the deaths of Nahum and Nabi, that of Thaddeus being already known, and mentioned that the cause seemed to be the same strange ailment which had killed the livestock. He also stated that Merwin and Zenus had disappeared. There was considerable questioning at the police station, and in the end, Ami was compelled to take three officers to the Gardner farm, together with the coroner, the medical examiner, and the veterinary, who had treated the diseased animals. He went much against his will, for the afternoon was advancing, and he feared the fall of night over that accursed place. But it was some comfort to have so many people with him. The six men drove out in a Democrat wagon, following Ami's buggy, and arrived at the pest-ridden farmhouse about four o'clock. Used as the officers were to gruesome experiences, not one remained unmoved at what was found in the attic and under the red-checked tablecloth on the floor below. The whole aspect of the farm, with its grey desolation, was terrible enough, but those two crumbling objects were beyond all bounds. No one could look long at them, and even the medical examiner admitted that there was very little to examine. Specimens could be analysed, of course, so he busied himself in obtaining them, and here it develops that a very puzzling aftermath occurred at the college laboratory where the two files of dust were finally taken. Under the spectroscope, both samples gave off an unknown spectrum, in which many of the baffling bands were precisely like those which the strange meteor had yielded in the previous year. The property of emitting this spectrum vanished in a month, the dust thereafter consisting mainly of alkaline phosphates and carbonates. Ami would not have told the men about the well if he had thought they meant to do anything then and there. It was getting towards sunset, and he was anxious to be away. But he could not help glancing nervously at the stony curb by the great sweep, and when a detective questioned him, he admitted that Nahum had feared something down there, so much so that he had never even thought of searching it for Merwin or Zenus. After that, nothing would do but that they empty and explore the well immediately, so Ami had to wait trembling, while pail after pail of rank water was hauled up and splashed on the soaking ground outside. The men sniffed in disgust at the fluid, and toward the last held their noses against the futor they were uncovering. It was not so long a job as they had feared it would be, since the water was phenomenally low. There is no need to speak too exactly of what they found. Merwin and Zenus were both there, in part, though the vestiges were mainly skeletal. There were also a small deer and a large dog in about the same state, and a number of bones of smaller animals. The ooze and slime at the bottom seemed inexplicably porous and bubbling, and a man who descended on handholds with a long pole found that he could sink the wooden shaft to any depth in the mud of the floor without meeting any solid obstruction. Twilight had now fallen, and lanterns were brought from the house. Then, when it was seen that nothing further could be gained from the well, everyone went indoors and conferred in the ancient sitting room while the intermittent light of a spectral half-moon played wanly on the grey desolation outside. The men were frankly nonplussed by the entire case and could find no convincing common element to link the strange vegetable conditions, the unknown disease of livestock and humans, and the unaccountable deaths of Merwin and Zenus in the tainted well. They had heard the common country talk, and it is true, but could not believe that anything contrary to natural law had occurred. No doubt the meteor had poisoned the soil, but the illness of person and animals who had eaten nothing grown in that soil was another matter. Was it the well water? Very possibly. It might be a good idea to analyse it. But what peculiar madness could have made both boys jump into the well? Their deeds were so similar, and the fragments showed that they had both suffered from the grey, brittle death. Why was everything so grey and brittle? It was the coroner, seated near a window overlooking the yard, who first noticed the glow about the well. Night had fully set in, and all the abhorrent ground seemed faintly luminous with more than the fitful moonbeams. 
But this new glow was something definite and distinct and appeared to shoot up from the black pit like a softened ray from a searchlight, giving dull reflections in the little ground pools where the water had been emptied. It had a very queer colour, and as all the men clustered round the window, Amy gave a violent start. For this strange beam of ghastly miasma was to him of no unfamiliar hue. He had seen that colour before, and feared to think what it might mean. He had seen it in the nasty, brittle globule in that aerolite two summers ago, had seen it in the crazy vegetation of the springtime, and had thought he had seen it for an instant that very morning against the small, barred window of that terrible attic room where nameless things had happened. It had flashed there a second, and a clammy and hateful current of vapour had brushed past him, and then poor Nahum had been taken by something of that colour. He had said so at the last, said it was like the globule and the plants. After that had come the runaway in the yard and the splash in the well, and now that well was belching forth to the night a pale, insidious beam of the same demoniac tint. It does credit to the alertness of Amy's mind that he puzzled even at that tense moment over a point which was essentially scientific. He could not but wonder at his gleaning of the same impression from a vapour glimpsed in the daytime against a window opening in the morning sky and from a nocturnal exhalation seen as a phosphorescent mist against the black and blasted landscape. It wasn't right. It was against nature and he thought of those terrible last words of his stricken friend. It come from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. All three horses outside, tied to a pair of shriveled saplings by the road, were now neighing and pawing frantically. The wagon driver started for the door to do something, but Amy laid a shaky hand on his shoulder. Don't go out there, he whispered. There's more to this nor what we know, Nahum said something lived in the well that sucks your life out. He said it must be some that growed from a round ball like one we all seen in the meteor stone that fell a year ago June. Sucks and burns, he said, and is just a cloud of colour like that light out there now that you can hardly see and can't tell what it is. Nahum thought it feeds on everything living and gets stronger all the time. He said he's seen it this last week. It must be something from a way off in the sky, like the men from the college of last year says the meteor stone was. The way it's made, and the way it works, ain't like no way a god's world. It's some at from beyond. So the men paused indecisively as the light from the well grew stronger, and the hitched horses pawed and whinnied in increasing frenzy. It was truly an awful moment. With terror in that ancient and accursed house itself, Four monstrous sets of fragments, two from the house and two from the well, in the woodshed behind, and that shaft of unknown and unholy iridescence from the slimy depths in front. Amy had restrained the driver on impulse, forgetting how uninjured he himself was after the clammy brushing of that coloured vapour in the attic room, but perhaps it is just as well that he acted as he did. No one will ever know what was abroad that night and though the blasphemy from beyond had not so far hurt any human of unweakened mind, there is no telling what it might not have done at that last moment, and with its seemingly increased strength and the special signs of purpose, it was soon to display beneath the half-clouded moonlit sky. All at once, one of the detectives at the window gave a short, sharp gasp. The others looked at him, and then quickly followed his own gaze upward to the point at which its idle straying had been suddenly arrested. There was no need for words. What had been disputed in country gossip was disputable no longer, and it is because of the thing which every man of that party agreed in whispering later on that strange days are never talked about in Arkham. It is necessary to premise that there was no wind at that hour of the evening. One did arise not long afterward, but there was absolutely none then. Even the dry tips of the lingering hedge mustard, grey and blighted, and the fringe on the roof of the standing Democrat wagon were unstirred. And yet, amid that tense, godless calm, the high bare boughs of all the trees in the yard were moving. 
They were twitching morbidly and spasmodically, clawing in convulsive and epileptic madness at the moonlit clouds, scratching impotently in the noxious air as if jerked by some allied and bodiless line of linkage with subterrene horrors writhing and struggling below the black roots. Not a man breathed for several seconds. Then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon, and the silhouette of clutching branches faded out momentarily. At this there was a general cry, muffled with awe, but husky and almost identical from every throat. For the terror had not faded with the silhouette, and in a fearsome instant of deeper darkness the watchers saw wriggling at the treetop height a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance tipping each bough like the fire of St. Elmo or the flames that come down on the apostles' heads at Pentecost. It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a glutted swarm of corpse-fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh, and its colour was that same nameless intrusion which Ami had come to recognise and dread. All the while, the shaft of phosphorescence from the well was getting brighter and brighter, bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality which far outraced any image their conscious minds could form. It was no longer shining out. It was pouring out, and as the shapeless stream of unplaceable colour left the well, it seemed to flow directly into the sky. And in the fearsome instant of deeper darkness, the watchers saw wriggling at that treetop height a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance, tipping each bough like the fire of St. Elmo, and all the while the shaft of phosphorescence from the well was getting brighter and brighter, and bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality. It was no longer shining out, it was pouring out, and as the shapeless stream of unplaceable colour left the well, it seemed to flow directly into the sky. The veterinary shivered and walked to the front door to drop the heavy extra bar across it. Ami shook no less, and had to tug and point for lack of a controllable voice when he wished to draw notice to the growing luminosity of the trees. The neighing and stamping of the horses had become utterly frightful but not a soul of that group in the old house would have ventured forth for any earthly reward. With the moments the shining of the trees increased, while their restless branches seemed to strain more and more toward verticality. The wood of the well sweep was shining now, and presently a policeman dumbly pointed to some wooden sheds and beehives near the stone wall on the west. They were commencing to shine, too, though the tethered vehicles of the visitors seemed so far unaffected. Then there was a wild commotion and clopping in the road, and as Ami quenched the lamp for better seeing, they realised that the span of frantic greys had broken their sapling and run off with the Democrat wagon. The shock served to loosen several tongues, and embarrassed whispers were exchanged. It spreads on everything organic that's been around here, muttered the medical examiner. No one replied, but the man who had been in the well gave a hint that his long pole must have stirred up something intangible. It was awful, he added. There was no bottom at all, just ooze and bubbles and the feeling of something lurking under there. Ami's horse still pawed and screamed deafeningly in the road outside and nearly drowned its owner's faint quaver as he mumbled his formless reflections. It come from that stone. It grow down there. It got everything living. It fed itself on M, mind and body. Thad and Merwin, Zenus and Nabby, Nahum was the last. They all drunk the water. It got strong on them. It come from beyond. While well, things ain't like they be here. Now it's going home. At this point, as the column of unknown colour flared suddenly stronger and began to weave itself into fantastic suggestions of shape, which each spectator later described differently, there came from poor tethered hero such a sound as no man before or since ever heard from a horse. Every person in that low-pitched sitting room stopped his ears, and Ami turned away from the window in horror and nausea. Words could not convey it. When Ami looked out again, the hapless beast lay huddled inert on the moonlit ground between the splintered shafts of the buggy. That was the last of Hero till they buried him next day. 
But the present was no time to mourn, for almost at this instant a detective silently called attention to something terrible in the very room with them. In the absence of the lamplight, it was clear that a faint phosphorescence had begun to pervade the entire apartment. It glowed on the broad planked floor where the rag carpet left it bare and shimmered over the sashes of the small paned windows. It ran up and down the exposed corner posts, coruscated about the shelf and mantel, and infected the very doors and furniture. Each minute saw it strengthen, and at last it was very plain that healthy living things must leave that house. Amy showed them the back door and the path up through the fields to the ten-acre pasture. They walked and stumbled as in a dream, and did not dare look back till they were far away on the high ground. They were glad of the path, for they could not have gone the front way by that well. It was bad enough passing the glowing barn and sheds, and those shining orchard trees with their gnarled, fiendish contours. But thank heaven, the branches did their worst, twisting high up. The moon went under some very black clouds as they crossed the rustic bridge over Chapman's Brook, and it was blind groping from there to the open meadows. When they looked back toward the valley and the distant gardener place at the bottom, they saw a fearsome sight. All the farm was shining with the hideous unknown blend of colour. Trees, buildings, and even such grass and herbage as had not been wholly changed to lethal grey brittleness. The boughs were all straining skyward, tipped with tongues of foul flame and lambent tricklings of the same monstrous fire were creeping about the ridgepoles of the house, barn and sheds. It was a scene from a vision of Fuseli, and over all the rest reigned that riot of luminous amorphousness, that alien and undimensioned rainbow of cryptic poison from the well, seething, feeling, lapping, reaching, scintillating, straining, and malignly bubbling in its cosmic and unrecognisable chromaticism. Then, without warning, the hideous thing shot vertically up toward the sky like a rocket or meteor, leaving behind no trail and disappearing through a round and curiously regular hole in the clouds before any man could gasp or cry out. No watcher can ever forget that sight, and Amy stared blankly at the stars of Cygnus, Deneb twinkling above the others where the unknown colour had melted into the Milky Way. But his gaze was the next moment called swiftly to earth by the crackling in the valley. It was just that, only a wooden ripping and crackling and not an explosion, as so many others of the party vowed. Yet the outcome was the same, for in one feverish kaleidoscopic instant there burst up from that doomed and accursed farm a gleamingly eruptive cataclysm of unnatural sparks and substance blurring the glance of the few who saw it and sending forth to the zenith a bombarding cloudburst of such coloured and fantastic fragments as our universe must needs disown. Through quickly reclosing vapours they followed the great morbidity that had vanished, and in another second they had vanished too. Behind and below was only a darkness to which the men dared not return, and all about was a mounting wind which seemed to sweep down in black, fraught gusts from interstellar space. It shrieked and howled and lashed the fields and distorted woods in a mad cosmic frenzy, till soon the trembling party realised it would be no use waiting for the moon to show what was left down there at Nahum's. Too awed even to hint theories, the seven shaking men trudged back toward Arkham by the North Road. Ami was worse than his fellows, and begged them to see him inside his own kitchen instead of keeping straight on to town. He did not wish to cross the blighted, wind-whipped woods alone to his home on the main road, for he had had an added shock that the others were spared, and was crushed forever with a brooding fear he dared not even mention for many years to come. As the rest of the watchers on that tempestuous hill had stolidly set their faces toward the road, Ami had looked back an instant at the shadowed valley of desolation so lately sheltering his ill-starred friend, and from that stricken faraway spot he had seen something feebly rise, only to sink down again upon the place from which the great shapeless horror had shot into the sky. It was just a colour, but not any colour of our earth or heavens. 
and because Ami recognized that color and knew that this last faint remnant must still lurk down there in the well, he has never been quite right since. Ami would never go near the place again. It is forty-four years now since the horror happened, but he has never been there and will be glad when the new reservoir blots it out. I shall be glad too, for I do not like the way the sunlight changed colour around the mouth of that abandoned well I passed. I hope the water will always be very deep, but even so, I shall never drink it. I do not think I shall visit the Arkham country hereafter. Three of the men who had been with Ami returned the next morning to see the ruins by daylight, but there were not any real ruins. Only the bricks of the chimney, the stones of the cellar, some mineral and metallic litter here and there, and the rim of that nefandous well. Save for Ami's dead horse, which they towed away and buried, and the buggy which they shortly returned to him, everything that had ever been living had gone. Five eldritch acres of dusty grey desert remained, nor has anything ever grown there since. To this day, it sprawls open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields, and the few who have ever dared glimpse it in spite of the rural tales have named it the Blasted Heath. The rural tales are queer. They might be even queerer if city men and college chemists could be interested enough to analyse the water from that disused well, or the grey dust that no wind seems ever to disperse. Botanists, too, ought to study the stunted flora on the borders of that spot, for they might shed light on the country notion that the blight is spreading, little by little, perhaps an inch a year. People say the colour of the neighbouring herbage is not quite right in the spring, and that wild things leave queer prints in the light winter snow. Snow never seems quite so heavy on the blasted heath as it is elsewhere. Horses, the few that are left in this motor age, grow skittish in the silent valley, and hunters cannot depend on their dogs too near the splotch of greyish dust. They say the mental influences are very bad too. Numbers went queer in the years after Nahum's taking, and always they lacked the power to get away. Then the stronger-minded folk all left the region, and only the foreigners tried to live in the crumbling old homesteads. They could not stay, though, and one sometimes wonders what insight beyond ours their wild, weird stories of whispered magic have given them. Their dreams at night, they protest, are very horrible in that grotesque country, and surely the very look of the dark realm is enough to stir a morbid fancy. No traveller has ever escaped a sense of strangeness in those deep ravines, and artists shiver as they paint thick woods whose mystery is as much of the spirits as of the eye. I myself am curious about the sensation I derived from my one lone walk before Ami told me his tale. When twilight came, I had vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for odd timidity about the deep skyey voids above had crept into my soul, do not ask me for my opinion. I do not know, that is all. There was no one but Ami to question, for Arkham people will not talk about the strange days, and all three professors who saw the aerolite and its coloured globule are dead. There were other globules, depend upon that. One must have fed itself and escaped, and probably there was another which was too late. No doubt it is still down the well, I know there was something wrong with the sunlight I saw above that miasmal brink. The rustics say the blight creeps an inch a year, so perhaps there is a kind of growth or nourishment even now. But whatever demon hatchling is there, it must be tethered to something or else it would quickly spread. Is it fastened to the roots of those trees that claw the air? One of the current Arkham tales is about fat oaks that shine and move as they ought not to do at night. What it is? Only God knows. In terms of matter, I suppose the thing Ami described would be called a gas, but this gas obeyed laws that are not of our cosmos. This was no fruit of such worlds and suns as shine on the telescopes and photographic plates of our observatories. This was no breath from the skies whose motions and dimensions our astronomers measure or deem too vast to measure. It was just a colour out of space a frightful messenger from unformed realms of infinity beyond all nature as we know it. 
from realms whose mere existence stuns the brain and numbs us with the black extracosmic gulfs it throws open before our frenzied eyes. I doubt very much if Ami consciously lied to me, and I do not think his tale was all a freak of madness as the townsfolk had forewarned. Something terrible came to the hills and valleys on that meteor, and something terrible, though I know not in what proportion, still remains. I shall be glad to see the water come. Meanwhile, I hope nothing will happen to Ami. He saw so much of the thing, and its influence was so insidious. Why has he never been able to move away? How clearly he recalled those dying words of Nahum's. Can't get away. Draws ye. You know, summit's coming. But tain't no use. Ami is such a good old man. When the reservoir gang gets to work, I must write the chief engineer to keep a sharp watch on him. I would hate to think of him as the grey, twisted, brittle monstrosity which persists more and more in troubling my sleep. The End <laughs>